Hello and welcome to Skeptics in the Pub Online. My name is Andy Wilson. You can find me by following Incredulosi on Twitter, which I would love you to do. I'm from the Merseyside Skeptic Society and also a co-organiser for QED Conference. We've been meeting here every Thursday since the Earth was formed, or at least it feels that way. Skeptics in the Pub Online is a collaboration between UK skeptic groups to provide weekly interesting talks, much in the same way as was done in pubs before the global pandemic. Close them all. There's a huge back catalogue of talks on YouTube. Just search for Skeptics in the Pub Online in there. If you like what we're doing, um, be sure be sure to send us some money at http colon slash slash sitp dot online slash donate. Also, if you want to address the inevitable inaccuracies in my questions during the show, we can meet in our virtual pub, the Lock-Ins Razor, afterward, and maybe have a fight about it in the car park. That's also at the SITP online URL, but this time just click the link for the Lock-Ins Razor and you will be in. Now, we're living in tricky and confusing times. The UK seems to be dropping all of the COVID rules on the 19th of July. Meanwhile, the Delta variant is running amok in the under 25s and prompting more xenophobia than is reasonable. And to cap it all, England beat Germany. And we're in the last 16 of Euro 2020. And it's not even 2020. (laughs) Shall we restore some normality? Shall we shock our senses back to reality? Yes, we will. Welcome to Incredulous. Episode 52. Incredulous is a skeptically themed panel show in which the panelists vie for the lofty and rare accolade of Incredulous Champion. They will bite, tear, and chew to fulfill this ambition, or politely tell a somewhat humorous tale. Let's meet the panel. Hello, uh, my name is Jonathan Jerry. I'm a science communicator based in Montreal, Canada, and I'm also the co host of the Body of Evidence podcast. Hello, I'm Michael Marshall. I'm the project director of the Good Thinking Society and the editor of The Skeptic Magazine. If you want to find The Skeptic Magazine, you go to uh, uh, HTTP. There's a colon, there's a slash. I think you first need to download AOL so you stick your CD in. You search Michael Shermer. You'll be be with it. It's fine. Um, Hi, I'm Carmen De Cruz. I am a part-time stand-up comedian and drag queen, a full-time pearl-clutching project manager, and the co-host of London Skeptics in the Pub, back when we had a pub, and Conway Hall's Thinking on Sunday Talks. Fantastic. Right, well, we have three rounds for you tonight. Round one will take us to a 15-minute break, and then we'll return with rounds two and three. And our incredulous audience will once more be playing a big role in round three. But we begin, as ever, with topical tales. And the first question is for Marsh. Marsh, who's been told, no, you Vatican't? Right, Andy, this is the clarification from the Catholic Church uh, earlier this year that they're not going to allow same-sex marriage. Despite comments from Pope Francis in October 2020 that he su- that sort of suggested that he was in favour of same-sex unions, that he might even be willing to offer an olive branch to gay Catholics. And um, apparently, according to the Vatican's Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, the reason that same-sex marriage will continue to be a no-no for gay Catholics is because it is impossible for God to bless sin. And it's nice to finally have an answer to that age old theological thought experiment. Can God create a social stigma too heavy for him to lift? We've now got an answer to that. Um, It's also nice to have a firm definition of the extent of God's powers after all this time as well. You know, because he's a character, he's been around for so long. It's never really been clear what he can and can't do, what is what the edges of his his abilities are. You know, create the entire universe out of nothing. Fine. Bring the dead back to life. Piece of cake. Stand by smiling while while Philip tells Marcus he loves him. That's impossible. He can't do it. That's outside of the scope of his possibilities. And it sort of reminds me a bit of like the old comic book heroes like Superman, you know, where for a long time it was just like, oh, yeah, you know, he can do literally anything. You know, his eyes shoot lasers. He's telepathic. He's telekinetic. He can wipe your memory with a kiss, which is all powers that Superman had. That last one is particularly interesting and doesn't really stand up to a modern scrutiny. But, you know, after a while, audiences wanted... They wanted more sophisticated storylines. And so the writers had to kind of dial back some of these weirder powers. And it's a bit like that with the writers of God. But rather than satisfying demanding comic book readers, they're just pandering to change averse conservative bigots, which, to be fair, is a community that's also served in part by the comic book industry, to be fair. Um, 
<laughs> Pope Francis has said this uh, this recent anti-gay statement from the Vatican was uh, apparently not intended to be a form of unjust discrimination, but rather, he said, a reminder of the truth of the liturgical right uh, in the sense that gay people have the right to go fuck themselves um, as long as they don't but intend to other. go fuck each other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, and this this goes completely against Francis' reputation as the cool pope as well. And it, it made me think of a story that I was once told by a friend of mine in the entertainment industry about a very, very famous actor who's really well known for being an incredibly nice guy who shall remain anonymous. And a, according to this possibly ap apocryphal tale, part of the reason he's so well, re so well regarded and thought of as such a, a lovely down to earth guy is that he often goes to set with his partner, right? So when he asks for a bottle of water and they don't have the brand of sparkling water that he demands, he's totally fine with it. You know, he got he has a nice little chat. It's totally fine. Don't worry about it. And then he goes for a happy, contented little walk while his partner comes in and tears a strip off whoever was meant to get him that bottled water. And then he comes back sweet as pie to carry on chatting, such a lovely down to earth normal bloke while his sparkling water arrives. And I'm not saying that story is definitely true, but it does feel a little bit like how the Vatican are with this pub. You know, they play the bad guy, telling those horrible gay people what they can and can't do, while Francis gets to look all smiley and friendly and lovely like Tom Hanks. Um, <laughs> the the upshot of all of this is some frantic rowing back. Literally no link between those two parts of the... Uh, not at all, uh, not at all. No. Um, the upshot of all of this is some absolutely frantic rowing back from Francis. And it's not the first time he's had to do this. You know, in, in 2013, he asked, who am I to judge gay people? presumably leading somebody in the Vatican to print him out another copy of his job description. And <laughs> we've we've all been there. You know, you sat in the meeting at work and you've been absolutely furious. Why hasn't this task been done only to find out it was on your to-do list? And this is what Francis gets for forgetting how to log on to Trello. You know, he'd have, he'd have gone in and seen he had a judge gay people card in his workflow just sitting waiting to be worked on. Um, but by 2018, it seems like he'd actually got the memo from this. And uh, he gave an interview explaining how worried he was about the issue of gay clergy. He said, um, the question of homosexuality is a very serious one. And we can only speculate as to what he thought the question of homosexuality was. But um, I'm guessing it was either who's the bigger icon, Liza Minnelli or Barbara Streisand? Um, how many A's are there in Yas Queen? Um, or... Uh, or is identification? Please say that again. <laughs> Never again. Can um, we have a something like that, Marsh? <laughs> absolutely not, Andy. But yeah, so you've got the Liza Minnelli question: How many A's are there in the Yas Queen? There you go, Jonathan. Um, or uh, is identification with classically stereotypical gay culture regressive, or are these tropes actually social signifiers of a distinct and vibrant community? And um, these may be the questions that Pope Francis is asking himself. But um, in any case, whatever answer. Uh, he, he's come up to to whatever question he thought homosexual presented. Um, that answer was to, quote, urge that persons with this rooted tendency not be accepted into the ministry or consecrated life because he said homosexuality is fashionable, but there is no room for it in the lives of priests and nuns. And people are going to think this is the Catholic Church being regressive and bigoted. But I actually think this is a very smart and very sensible move by the Catholic Church, right? Because we know that religion is on the win. There are fewer and fewer young people finding faith, and the Catholic Church in particular is losing a hell of a lot of market share. Like, look at Ireland, right? That is a country that was, it's fair to say, quite Catholic in quite a few places, to the extent that the church would use Ireland to quite literally launder their reputations. Um, but then there was the 2015 uh, vote for gay marriage, the 2018 landslide uh, vote uh, legalizing abortion, and suddenly it was... Slan Gordil, Catholic majority. Um, and when you're getting less and less popular, you're faced with two choices. You could either modernize, like the Methodists did this week when they voted to allow gay marriage, or you find yourself a new, unique selling point. And that's what the Catholic Church are doing. Because think about it. What is the Catholic Church known for? Having vast amounts of wealth? Well, their $15 billion in the bank makes them paupers compared to the Mormon Church with their $100 billion. So they lose that. Maybe they're known for having property all over the world. We'll step forward the Church of Scientology, which has an incredible international property portfolio. Maybe they're known for displaying religious commitment by wearing a symbol of faith as a mark on their foreheads. But Catholics do that one Wednesday a year, whereas the, the Jains and the Hindus have the bindi all year round. So they lose on that. 
maybe you associate Catholics with um, men in dresses making virtue of the fact that they don't have sex, but meet the Buddhists who beat them hands down at that particular attribute. Proof of life after death, you're thinking of spiritualism. Or the use of candles and incense, that's Shintoism. Worshipping statues and icons, you're back to Hinduism again. Maybe it's that Catholics aren't allowed to eat meat or certain meats on a Friday, but Muslims aren't allowed to eat certain meats ever, so they beat them. Maybe it's that they believe Jesus came back from the dead and that one day he'll return to lead us into heaven. Well, the Raelians not only believe that, but they also believe he's already here in the form of a 1970s French racing driver called Claude. You might think the Vatican can at least try to hold on to the title of being the most likely to be exercising secret power and influence over geopolitical events. But if you think that, you've never searched Twitter for the word Jews. Um, maybe, maybe you think that the Catholics are best known for being far too comfortable causing up to the Nazis. But that's what the American atheist movement's for now. So they lose on that one as well. So maybe, maybe you think Catholicism is all about claiming total mora uh, moral and ethical superiority over everybody you meet, but people who want to do that these days just declare themselves anti-theists. So they lose on that one as well. So honestly, after all of this, I think disavowing gay couples, it's not an act of bigotry. It's just very, very savvy act of market differentiation and self-preservation, if you ask me. Very good. Yes. Well, I'm convinced, Mark. I'm convinced. <laughs> yes, the Catholic Church continues its moral crusade to marginalise great swaths of its followers. It's having the same effect, as Marsh has mentioned, on its clergy, who are discouraged from publicly acknowledging their sexuality, even if they are complying with their forced sexual abstinence. And I say forced sexual abstinence, it's important to remember that priests rely on their positions to make a living, to be housed, and in some countries for their health care. Church management has a tight grip on their cassocks. A New York Times article from 2019 brought this issue to light with the headline, it's not a closet, it's a cage, and estimated that between 20 and 30 percent of priests are gay based on estimates from gay priests. I don't know if gay priests have a particularly strong gaydar, but I'm assuming that they do. Can I, can I say something about this this whole story? So, yeah. so uh, you know, the BBC News covered this, and my favorite part of the article was at the very end, and, and Mosh kind of hinted at it, which, which was, you know, a few times uh, in the past few years, Pope Francis said, hey, gays are cool, I'm not going to judge them, they have a right to a family. And then the article says, quote, the Vatican later attempted to clarify the comments, saying they were taken out of context and did not indicate support for same-sex marriage. Oh, for God's sake. I mean, yet, yet another reminder, right? Like, like that of a self-professed moral authority, like the Catholic Church moving child abusers from parish to parish so that they can continue to molest children, that they've got it backwards. When you say you were taken out of context, it means you said something really vile and you're backpedaling. You don't say that when you've said something normal and, and loving and progressive and humane and morally upstanding. I mean, come on, you don't hear the PR department at Nike's release a statement to the press saying, actually, when we said just do it, we were taken out of context. This slogan does not indicate support for motivation and self-empowerment. <laughs> Nike does not believe sedentary people people can successfully complete an exercise program. Go for, a walk around the, go for a walk around the block or join a game of hopscotch. In short, we do not believe people can just do it. We also regret the Shia LaBeouf incident. Fantastic. I also, in your monologue there, Marsh, I thought the Raelians came out pretty well there, didn't they? I mean, they'll, they'll be quoting that they've been in an article <laughs> with the Catholics, the Scientologists and everybody. Yeah, they're, they're going to be saying we are better than the Catholic Church at a very, very specific <laughs> weird thing. I, I don't know that's a great selling point. Marginally better than the Catholic Church is not the kind of thing you put on your uh, on your marketing brochures. <laughs> Excellent. Um, uh, something you didn't mention in there was uh, Catholics um, uh, sort of adherence to a kind of faux cannibalism that I feel there aren't many religions really talking about nowadays. Um, with you know turning the you know the bread into the body of Christ, um, that's just something I feel like Catholics really do have a strong market share on globally. That's true. They should lean into that and just go full cannibalistic. Yeah. Because <laughs> no one else is going that way. That's that's the only. And any in a couple of years' time, the Catholic Church would like to uh, walk back their comments that you should go out and just eat your neighbours. <laughs> we were okay. taken out of context. <laughs> <laughs> Follow Incredulosi for more marketing tips. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> Jonathan. Is one of the marketing tips come up with a Twitter handle that people can spell, Andy? Is that a yeah, key marketing It's got a K in it. It's got a K in it. All right. Uh, yes. Follow me, don't follow me. Whatever. <laughs> okay. um, so, <laughs> Jonathan, whose yes. sunny solution to climate change is, is sheer lunacy? Well, um, that would be Lewis Buller Gomert Jr., uh, known to late night talk show hosts in need of a quick zinger as Louis Gomert, um, a U.S. representative from Texas, a Republican, because obviously, uh, and a quote unquote member of the Tea Party movement. Because even more, obviously, uh, in the inevitable Dinesh D'Souza directed hagiographic movie on Louis Gohmert's life, Gohmert will be played by Armin Shimmerman, uh, who famously played Quark on Star Trek Deep Space Nine <laughs> and the high school principal on Buffy, or by an old man Muppet left over from the old show and possessed by the spirit of Ebenezer Scrooge, whichever is available. And um, I, I bring him up in response to your question, Andy, because he was recently video chatting with a senior forestry service official during a national resources committee oh, hearing yeah. about mm -hmm. what the forest service and the Bureau of Land Management could do about the issue of climate change. Seems and, reasonable. I mean, unlike what you may assume, uh, the people on the call were not shouting, oh my God, oh my God, the entire planet is on fire and we have to do something. <laughs> Rather, it was a very polite, very reserved and diplomatic drive off into a very deep ravine uh, with the foot squarely on the gas pedal because, hey, let's all slowly and professionally discuss the reality of massive changes to our planet and the people living on it in subcommittee 67A, mm -hmm. chapter five, unit epsilon sub theta. <laughs> so Louis Gohmert basically said that as far as he knew, Climate change was due to the orbits of the moon and Earth changing and to solar flare activity. And so he asked with a serious face if there was anything that the National Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management could do to change the course of the moon's orbit or of the Earth's orbit around the sun, since that would have, he claimed, profound effects on our climate. Now, some people thought that he was seriously suggesting that we look into a feat of solar system engineering only dreamt of by the writers of Star Trek The Next Generation. But it was clear to me that he was being sarcastic. And to prove my point, I decided to take a look at Louis Gohmert's Wikipedia page. Nice. Now, I I'm sorry, Andy, but since the podcast citation needed does not allow for guest stars, um, I have decided to turn my segment on your show into citation needed. So okay. let's go to Wikipedia. Uh, the Internet Encyclopedia, uh, which lists Andy Wilson as a Scottish landscape <laughs> painter. <laughs> uh, or the frontman for New Zealand punk trio Die, Die, Die. I've had a very busy lockdown. <laughs> or as a ballet dancer. Andy, you really have to pick one job and stick to it. <laughs> so you carry on. Gilbert. I'll be right back. Yeah. Um, so... Um, I guess, are we continuing? What is happening now? I don't know what, to, what you've done is... The Scottish yeah, landscape painter said something that's triggered Andy to forget oh, really? that on a live broadcast. I apologize, Andy, for triggering you. Uh, I didn't Did, mean to do so. the doorbell, Andy? Did you have to let the cat out? And... Yeah, something like that. <laughs> so, so, boys and girls, let's go, life, back, folks. let's go back to Wikipedia uh, and, and look at Louis Gomert. So Louis Gomert, according to Wikipedia, served in the JAG core, uh, which makes him a jag off. And uh, jag, of course, stands for judge, jury, and executioner, and is the favorite TV show of the 50 to 70 who lives in Jacksonville, Florida demo. Uh, very key demographic for television. Season 76 of that show is particularly poignant. Um, in 2013, following the Boston Marathon bombing, Gomert said that he didn't think the FBI had acted with due diligence regarding alleged bomber Tamerlan Sarnayev, because he said the FBI was more interested in Christian groups than in groups that might be considered less politically correct to target. This was immediately followed by Gomert rapidly pulling a random woman in a hijab close to his body and stating that he had a lot of Muslim friends. <laughs> Gomert also filed a lawsuit last December to prevent electoral votes for Joe Biden from being counted in Congress. Because if you don't count him, 
they never existed, <laughs> which is presumably what Gomert's mom taught him about his brain cells. <laughs> Honey, if you don't count them, they never existed. Much of Gomert's Wikipedia page, Andy, it reads like a teen magazine quiz called Are You and Jared Padalecki Compatible? But it's the tea, it's the tea Party edition, you know? Do you reject the scientific consensus on climate change? Would you also say that Pope Francis was incorrect in pointing out that climate change is a serious problem? <laughs> Do you think that life begins at conception? Do you oppose gays and lesbians from serving in the military? And do you think school teachers should be armed to the teeth? And are you ready to say it on Fox News two days after the Sandy Hook massacre? If you answered yes to all of the above, you are <laughs> Louis Gohmert's ideal <laughs> cisgendered heterosexual female prayer partner who must have excellent <laughs> cooking skills. Also, if I say Louis Gohmert and COVID-19, what 18 letter word comes to mind? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. He caught COVID-19 after not wearing a mask, which is true. That's way more than 18 letters, Andy, and it's more than one word. No, the word is hydroxychloroquine, which Beautiful. Dr. Louis Gohmert, MD from Gray's Anatomy University, <laughs> endorsed on Fox News because this is the kind of person you look to for medical advice and scientific assessment. The guy who wants to rearrange the solar system to bring the temperature down. But you know what's eyeball busting? Wait, what now? Is that we have now arrived at the section of his Wikipedia page titled controversies. That's right. <laughs> Everything I've said so far has been in the regular portion of the Wikipedia page, not in the controversy section. The fact that he thought the FBI was turning a blind eye on Muslim extremists was not controversial enough, apparently. Hydroxychloroquine for COVID on Fox News, not a controversy. In fact, it's pretty much expected. So what did make the cut? So it turns out that he once read a conservative op-ed in front of the House in 2012 that compared Barack Obama to Adolf Hitler. Also, he believes in terror babies, uh, which is not the title of an upcoming Shudder original uh, featuring Bruce Willis sleepwalking into another paycheck, uh, but rather <laughs> the claim that terrorists were giving birth in the U.S. so that their babies could be U.S. citizens, oh. and then they would get trained as terrorists, and they could easily infiltrate their country of birth to carry out their nefarious plans. Terror babies. <laughs> um, at the bottom of his Wikipedia page, it says, see also, and it points to other page on topics related to Louis Gohmert. And I want to send some flowers and Maybe my autographed copy of the Usual Suspects DVD, I know Brian Singer oof, did not age well, to the Wikipedia <laughs> editor, to the Wikipedia editor who made the choice on Louis Gohmert's Wikipedia page to write, see also our article on conspiracy theories. <laughs> And and look, I want to end on this delicious, the very delicious anecdote, which is that in 2012, Gomert stated his strong support of a trans Alaskan pipeline as a means for caribou to have more sex. Wait, what you ask? I'm glad you did, Andy. I'm glad what? you did. <laughs> yeah, I know. So let me explain. So caribou is what we in North America call reindeer, Andy. I'm glad I could clear that up. Thank you. Uh, but, but seriously, uh, Gomert said, quote, when the caribou want to go on a date, they invite each other to head over to the pipeline. So my real concern now is, if oil stops running through the pipeline, do we need a study to see how adversely the caribou would be affected if that warm oil ever quit flowing? <laughs> flow, baby, flow, tea party, baby. So I propose Louis Gomer from now on be referred to as the man more worried about caribou sex than about global warming. <laughs> <laughs> or caribou sex men for short. <laughs> Fantastic. Remind me again what that oil pipeline's called. Uh, it was it was a trans Alaskan pipeline. They may be the only trans rights that he's willing to fight for. <laughs> well done. Well done. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs>
I, I think you've been quite harsh on him here, to be honest, because he was he was proposing that that's we, possible. <laughs> well, he was proposing that we alter the orbit of the Earth in order to change the the way that the climate is changing, and that would work. So he is he is right on that. If we were to be in a different place relative to the sun, our climate would be different. So he's 100% right on the science there. And who else is he going to ask about moving the Earth, which, to be fair, is all of the land than the Bureau of Land Management? Who else is going to be involved in managing where that land is? They're exactly the people to ask about it. So I, I think this is a this is a politically motivated hit job, when frankly you just you're not willing to to discuss the real issues of the science. You're absolutely right. I think uh, I mean for further proof of 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 you know differences in climate depending on how far you are away from the sun, you just look at you just ask the people on Uranus, Mosh. I mean. It's, it's <laughs> That's when I first read this story, I kind of skimmed over it a bit, and the um, Bureau of Land... As you should, really. Yeah, well, yeah. the Bureau of Land Management has a, 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 the same acronym yes. as, as another organisation that's uh, yeah. sort of been in the news a lot in the last like year and a half, if not longer, actually. So, yeah, my first reading of this, I was like, that is massively outside the scope of that <laughs> priorities right now. Um, but yeah, but I did have a question actually. Um, how does one become a member of the Tea Party? Is it like, is there a membership card? Is there like a, is this a US thing? Do you actually like have? Is it is it not like Antifa where you can just say like, oh, I'm anti-fascist? Do you actually? Is there a process? Uh, I, I don't I don't know what that process would be. I, th I think when you start to go really, really off your rocker and you're a regular guest on Fox News, you de facto become a member of the Tea Party movement. Right. I think I think the cost, Carmen, is reputation. Okay. Basically. Okay. I was going to yeah. ask, it's one of those things like if you have to ask how much it is, you probably can't afford yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> All right. Very good. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, now, uh, speaking of dumb things said by politicians, I came across two books. One was called The 267 Stupidest Things Republicans Ever Said, and the other was called The 267 Stupidest Things Democrats Ever Said. Obviously, both were written before former President 45 was in office, because it would be impossible to edit that list down to 267 now. But my panel's job is to determine from the following list which is which. Note that these will be from, none of these will be from former President 45. Jonathan, I'll give you extra marks if you can guess who the politician was, which will be quite easy for this one, I think. So here's I'll the I'll give quote. you extra marks, Jonathan, if you do it without moving your lips. And if you just yeah. freeze while you're speaking, that would, uh, <laughs> that would really help us all. <laughs> so, Jonathan, uh, the quote is, what does an actor know about politics? Oh, is it Republican uh, or Democrat? And for extra marks, who is it? Uh, well, that would have been against uh, Ronald Reagan, so it would have been a Democrat who said it. Mm. Eh, eh, incorrect. Ah. It was said by Republican Ronald Swatter Reagan, <laughs> oh, criticizing Ed Asner, who was then president of the Screen Actors Guild, for opposing uh. American foreign policy. <laughs> That's brilliant. Ronald Reagan asks, what does an actor know about politics? Uh, Marsh, here's another one. We shall reach greater and greater platitudes of achievement. Was that Democrat or Republican? Um, so I, I think you're going to try and trick me into thinking this is Republican. I'm going to say Democrat because I reckon it might have been Biden at one point. <laughs> OK, well, the answer is ting, Democrat. Uh, but it was Richard J. Daly, who was mayor of Chicago in 1955 to 1976. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Richard. Was... It's obvious now, now I yeah. mentioned it, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it Carmen... sounded like something that George W. Bush would have said at some point. <laughs> yeah. It Carmen, did. an American politician said this. Wherever I have gone in this country, I have found Americans. Is that <laughs> Republican or Democrat? Oh, my gosh. I have. I mean, I would be completely... Oh, I so love that you're trying to work this out. I'm trying to work it out. I'm going to say Republican. Okay. Uh, but I actually don't know that much about US politics. Uh, well, I, this I'm... one's really, really well known. It is a Republican, so you win your points. Okay. It's Alf Landon, who was a 1936 Republican presidential nominee. Uh, yeah. Cool. Who literally nobody's ever heard of. <laughs> Jonathan. Uh, here's another one for you. Uh, oh, who boy. will the Antichrist be? I don't know. Nobody else knows. Of course, he'll be Jewish. 
Um, hmm. Who said that? Wow. Um, uh, no, just Republican or Democrats will be in right. it. Uh, you know, it's I'm 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 gonna go I'm gonna go with with a Republican. That's a very good bet. It was Jerry Falwell, president of the Moral Majority, whatever that is, 1979 to 1990. Another one for you, Marsh. Okay. Uh, I hope I stand for anti-bigotry, anti-Semitism, and anti-racism. Um, I don't buy into this Democrat-Republican dichotomy, so I'm going uh, Green Party. Uh, Jill Stein in 2020. <laughs> no, it was Republican George Bush. And the last one for Carmen... I feel bad about this one. Boy, they were big on crematoriums, weren't they? During a tour of Auschwitz. Oh, my God. I'm sorry. Oh. Oh. I'm, sorry I'm, I'm saying what he said. Yeah, yeah, I know. Oh, blimey. Uh, Republican or Democrat? I'm going to say Democrat. Well, Which? it was Republican oh. George Bush. No, really? Senior. The second one. They were both George Bush. No, there were, there were two George Bushes, Andy. Uh, no, they were the same George Bush who said both things. You've not oh. answered the question. Are you, are you avoiding the question? The question? What question? <laughs> there, was, there, was, there was George Bush Sr. and then there was George W. Bush. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes is the answer to that question. Uh, right. So, cut. Carmen. <laughs> <laughs> said by can't Andy Wilson, him down. apparently Republican. <laughs> <laughs> Are all the OCD people going nuts at the moment? Because I have an answer. In the chat. Yeah. Uh, George Bush Jr. Right. All right. Yeah, but... um, question three. Carmen, who is the nicest nurse you've ever heard of? Let's continue with the theme. Yeah. Who's the nicest nurse you've ever heard of? Uh, thank you. I'm so glad you asked. Um, You're welcome. An anti-vaxxer nurse who compared lockdown to the Holocaust was struck off. Kate Shemirani used her status as a healthcare professional to spread distorted propaganda and conspiracy theories about the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, Kate Shemirani is no Florence Nightingale, so please note that I have some trigger warnings in here for medical procedures, a little bit of anti-Semitism and some pretty horrific wordplay. Um, so <laughs> let's Good. begin. Um, I tried to write a vaccine joke, but you have to be over 34 to get it. Oh. <laughs> Solid. Yeah. Solid. Yeah. So Kate Shemirani is an aesthetic nurse who specialises in cosmetic treatment. And I'll come back to aesthetic nursing later because it is important. Um, she's also a campaigner who said that nurses were complicit in genocide. Vaccination teams should be renamed death squads and called the NHS the new Auschwitz in reference to the Holocaust. Now, um, I used to work in the NHS, it's a little known fact about me, and I can tell you for a fact that anti-Semitism is totally out of scope of the NHS's remit. Um, so all the budget cuts, this is some unfair expectations on what NHS staff do with their time. The article goes on to say that the mum of four also wrongly claimed that symptoms of the virus were caused by 5G and vaccines were rushed through because they want to kill you and face masks do not stop viruses. Much like Shemirani's grasp of correlation and causation, in some extreme cases, being a mum of four may lead to highly lethal logical failures. In my experience, one of the worst side effects of 5G is that my family can WhatsApp me at any time. <laughs> they say loss of taste is one of the symptoms of COVID, and I dyed my hair blue in May 2019, which is about the same time as the UK got its first 5G mask, so... <laughs> Your favourite conspiracy theory around right now is that the new £20 notes have a 5G tower and a coronavirus icon on them. What? Um, I've not heard this. I know. Um, I actually stopped doing cocaine pre-pandemic, so I can't prove this to you. You'll just have to trust me. The £20 note actually has JMW Turner printed on it, and I should not. Um, JMW Turner did a rather difficult to see painting that's called A Castle on a Wooded Slope, possibly Durham. Um, I don't know if there's any one way to be sure, but um, I, I promise you, I, if you Google it, A Castle on a Wooded Slope, possibly Durham, there is a very unclear painting of a castle that looks a lot like Durham, but we can't be <laughs> <laughs> I can't completely say that. 
vaccines were not rushed through. Um, but even if they were, there are way easier ways to kill people. For example, you could try, you could try spreading COVID-19 conspiracy theories. Um, face masks may not stop a virus, but they do place a physical barrier over people talking shit. So I'm still... <laughs> Ms. Shemarani took part in an anti-vaccine protest in central London's Trafalgar Square. She was suspended from the Nursing and Midwifery Council in July last year for spreading misinformation. An NMC Fitness to Practice Committee has ruled that her misconduct was so serious that she should be permanently struck from the nursing register. And the panel ruled her fitness to practice as a registered nurse was impaired on public protection and public interest grounds. Nic Nicola Jackson, chair of the committee, said Mrs Shemarani has not shown any remorse nor given any explanation for repeatedly spreading misinformation. Um, it actually goes on, there's quite a lot. I've got the whole article here and I wrote all my little notes in it. In the <laughs> so um, Mrs Shemarani makes incorrect and outdated comments on pharmacological improvements and presents in a dramatic and hysterical fashion to garner interest. Now the word hysterical was a medical term that's no longer used that yes. used to be used um, for why are you like this? So while <laughs> I do feel that Nicola Jackson has a point when it comes to Mrs. Shemarani. Okay. The panel considered Mrs. Shemarani to have been deeply offensive to the nursing and medical professions by using inflammatory and derogatory language to describe other nursing and healthcare professionals. Um, and she used her nursing status as a way to endorse her own distorted propaganda. Um, she's actually been a registered nurse with the NMC since 1986 and did work in the NHS, but now describes herself as an aesthetic nurse practitioner. She mm. used her social media brand, Kate Shemarani, natural nurse in a toxic world, to spread her opinions, often referring to herself as a registered nurse and wearing a nurse's uniform in her videos. The irony of slagging off other nurses while mimicking their look is absolutely not lost on me. Mm. So do you remember that uh, we said that she's a, uh, an aesthetic nurse and her social media brand is natural nurse in a toxic world. And it makes me really wonder what the cutoff point is for describing something as natural. So what, um, you know, what aesthetic nurses actually do. So it's all cosmetic surgery and some non-surgical procedures that include things like lip fillers. So fillers are made of sugar molecules or composed of hyaluronic acid, acids, collagens, which Could you repeat that, please? <laughs> it's, I'm going to have a sip of water for this next bit. <laughs> Hyaluronic hi, hi, acid, Andy. Hi, Come on, oh, get thanks, to the science. Jonathan. Right. <laughs> collagens, which may come from pigs, cows, cadavers, or may be generated in a laboratory, the person's own transplanted fat and biosynthetic polymers. Examples of the latter include... Calcium hydroxylapatite, polycaprolactone, polymethacrylate, and polylactic acid. Um, photofacials, I had to Google all of this. Oh, fantastic. I hope the incredulous audience is giving you some claps in the Twitch chat right now, because <laughs> I could never have got through those. I'm not a medical professional. I just project manager in the NHS. Um, so uh, photofacials are where lights and lasers are used to smooth out blemishes. Um, I use a filter. Um, <laughs> rotating instrument to remove the outer layers of the skin. Microneedling is pricking the skin to stimulate collagen growth. Ugh. There's no jokes in this bit, by the way. This is just me describing no. all of these horrible procedures. Tattoo removal uses lasers to burn tattoos off. Non-surgical body contouring includes freezing off pockets of fat, lasering them off or targeting them with deoxycholic acid which I had to google earlier to pronounce it but the only one I could find was one in an Indian accent so I don't know if I pronounced that correctly as we were <laughs> deoxycholic acid is a type of bile um, so yeah uh, so that's very delightful this is the natural nurse in a toxic world everyone that's fantastic. The uh, I say fantastic but I mean the opposite of oh, fantastic oh, you mentioned the uh, micro needling now I've encountered that recently, and somebody I know is a. I, uh, I, I was, I was going to say you do look younger, Andy, today. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a filter. Thank you, thank you. Every time I put a pound on, it stretches the skin a little bit more, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but micro needling is also used to uh, 
quote, improve the penetration of vitamin-based creams, or so the uh, so the story goes. That would be a version of aesthetic medicine, I'm guessing. But uh, yeah, I, oh. I don't know why you'd want to do that because it has, you know, sort of putting intentional cuts in your skin is going to have some other side effects as well. Yeah, I don't I, get that either. Well, I'm not I'm not an expert on the cosmetic. I, I do have some friends who have had some cosmetic um, like things done, and I never notice. Um, but yeah, they they sort of. It's very delicate. You see them sometimes touching their face in a particular way. And that's how I know one of my friends has recently had something done. <laughs> like drinking water, it's a hell of a lot cheaper. And I don't fancy a rotating device peeling off layers of my skin no. at, at this point in my life. Um, so, uh, yes, um, she posted to her social media, the nurse vaccination teams need to be renamed death squads and claimed that NMC was working to murder the old, infirm, disabled, vulnerable and sick, and said, we are now in possession of enough evidence against the NMC in relation to the facilitation of the terrorist agenda to commit genocide against the Nursing and Midwifery Council, those rapscallions. (laughs) But having worked in hospitals myself, I know that if a nurse really wanted to genocide some people, there are a lot easier ways to do it. What she seems to be implying is that the Nursing and Midwifery Council set up 5G masks in May 2019, redesigned the £20 note for release in February 2020, waited for a global pandemic, designed a vaccine with every single pharmaceutical company, persuaded Bill Gates to spend money on it, worked with a very obviously incompetent government to roll it out in tiny segments of the population over the course of several months, and kept it hidden from the general population were it not for the plucky enthusiasm of a lip-filling expert to expose the truth. Mm, sure. That's got to be at least band eight. Um, <laughs> 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 I've all heard how she spoke about the Nazification of the NHS and claimed that the NHS is the new Auschwitz while referring to healthcare, healthcare professionals as doctors and nurses of the Third Reich. Matt Hancock couldn't even s- source PPE during the pandemic. How is he going to kit out nurses in Hugo Boss Especially after we've just left the EU. <laughs> Matt Hancock's been very busy. I think we all know that. He's been way too busy to, to refit, uh, you, you know, to find uniforms for the NHS. So Ofcom opened an investigation after she was interviewed on Upfield FM. Um, and, yeah, congratulations to the listeners of Upfield FM. Um, Upfield FM also um, services the residents of Crowborough. So well done to anyone in Upfield and Crowborough in that area who were able to use the 5G masks and radio waves in order to report Mrs. Shemirani to Ofcom in the first place. Excellent work. <laughs> um, Mrs. Shemirani's social media accounts with Facebook, Twitter, YouTube and Instagram have since been blocked which just goes to show that one of the upsides of being a 5G conspiracy theorist is that you won't have to use it for very long. (laughs) Very good. Very nice. Very nice. I I want to say thank you for explaining aesthetic nurse practitioner, because when I read Mm. this, I was asking myself, what what does that mean? She looks the part, but she can't practice. I thought, (laughs) you know, I I thought kinky sex worker was the acceptable term for it now. But is I was wondering, is aesthetic nurse practitioner less stigmatizing? Is that what she was going for? But thank you for clearing that up. I thought it was not a not quite qualified anaesthetist or something like that. Mm. Now, I've got a friend who's an aesthetic nurse and she is a qualified nurse. I think she was a midwife and then she's just moved into it because the hours are nicer. <laughs> but it's all going to be private practice, right? The yeah. aesthetic stuff, yeah. it's all going to be private yeah. practice. Yeah. It's really weird for me seeing Shemirani get so much uh, coverage because I first came across her name in, I think, about 2016, 2017. I was at the most dangerous meeting I have ever been to in my life. It was a, an American uh, cancer cure guy oh. who'd come over to uh, to Liverpool to present to a room of about 70, 75 uh, people in Liverpool, most of whom were cancer patients, about why they shouldn't take very specific chemotherapy. What drug are you on? No, you need to stop taking that drug and just do my Gerson therapy instead. And uh, he mentioned wow. his partner was a nurse who was uh, facilitating lots of cancer patients coming to see him in uh, in Florida and uh, Mexico. And it was Kate Shemirani. No so way. I remember at the time writing it down and going, oh God, Kate Shemirani, I better look that up. And then here we are. She's like all over the news and her son is giving interviews to the BBC about why his mum is nuts, basically. Uh, um, okay. Yeah. 
Okay, you've just used up my follow-up question, so I'm going to press ahead as though <laughs> <laughs> um, So, Kate Shemirani, I think we've all met somebody like Kate. Her son, Sebastian, was asked about his views and came out firmly against his conspiracy theorist mother. When his comments were put to, when his comments were put to her, what does my panel think she said in response to her son's comments? Is it, one, she said, you know what, I should listen to my son. He's smart, intelligent, and I love him dearly. Or is it two? She didn't address what he said and instead said we are all, except her, of course, being controlled. So what do you think, Carmen? I mean, I'm going to say I would have said two, but she doesn't have a platform anymore to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. But, yeah, I would have said two. I, well, I think her answer, her answer was three, which is, could you speak louder? My tinfoil hat is blocking the sound of your voice right now. <laughs> well, here is what she said. Uh, I'm going to put it on screen, David, if you want to put it full screen. Um, she said, uh, from what I can see, it would appear a conspiracy theorist is actually now anyone who believes something other than what your controllers want them to believe. I find this deeply disturbing, as indeed do I. Um, okay, uh, that's the end of round one. Congratulations, everybody. Uh, we'll be back after the break with rounds two and three. For round three, we will be playing Defend the Indefensible, in which I will put topics to our guests which have been suggested by you, our highly distinguished and extremely cruel audience. They must defend whatever your proposition is for 45 seconds, offering a cohesive and humorous defense even though your idea may be diametrically opposed to their own actual views. So during the break, head over to sitp.online slash ask and add your suggestions as well as upvoting your favorites from other people. And remember, if, you're, if, you're, if yours is at the top and I read it out, if you've put your name in, uh, I'll be able to give you a shout out. Uh, you should also nip over to sitp.online slash donate and add an affordable donation to keep the wheels rolling there. Time now, 1946. Uh, we'll see you at 8 at, uh, what's 8 o'clock in the 2000? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you in 15 so minutes. So Thanks so for sorry. listening. Bye. See you Bye. Welcome back to Incredulous, episode 52. Remember to tune in next week for Resisting the Knowledge Dementors, The Truth About Post-Truth by Professor Stefan Lewandowski. Lewin Lewandowski? Lewandowski. Oh, yeah. Sounds I think handy. he co-wrote the handbook on uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the that's him, handbook. Yeah. Um, we have a couple more rounds for you. Remember to continue. You've been busy in Slido. You've been asking away and putting your suggestions in for round three. Defend the Indefensible. I already love several of them, and there's been plenty of liking action going on a little there. So thank you for that. We've got these two more rounds, um, and um, we're going to continue with round two. Just lost myself a little bit there. Uh, so we're going to call round two Funky Food. And we begin with a question authored by my Merseyside Skeptics colleague, Mark Horn. Thanks, Mark. Just me then. Okay. Uh, Jonathan. Yes. Which of the following is correct? Is it one? Uh, wait, I'm going to take notes, Andy, because your multiple choice answers are like three paragraph long each. <laughs> yeah, I can't um, remember them. This isn't homework. If, if I'm entirely honest with you, Mark hasn't helped here. <laughs> so which of, right. which of the following the is bus. correct? Unbelievable. All right. Is it number, number one? one? Uh -huh. Adolf Frederick, King of Sweden, was a constitutional monarch from 1751 to his death in 1771. He was just a figurehead at the time because the country was actually ruled by Sweden's two biggest political parties, the Hats, the Conservative Party of Officers and Gentlemen, and the Caps, the Liberal Party of Peasants and Clergy. He died at the age of 60 in Stockholm owing to digestive problems attributed to a feast of lobster, caviar, sauerkraut, kippers, champagne, and multiple servings of beloved Swedish pudding, Hetfag. Or is the following true? Charles Theodore, the Elector of Bavaria, had a variety of titles. He was the Count Palatine, Duke of Julich, 
Duke of Berg and Prince Elector of the famously non-Roman, non-holy, non-empirical Holy Roman Empire. He was also Duke of Bavaria from 1777 to his death in 1799, and so is probably known to skeptic, best known to skeptics as the man who disbanded the actual Illuminati. Theodore died after catching Legionnaire's disease from an undercooked and poorly stored Ganserbarton fe uh, feast. Ganserbarton is a meal with roasted Christmas goose. Or is it three? Countess Elizabeth Bathory of Hungary, a significant land landowner in the Kingdom of Hungary, is the official holder of the Guinness Book of Records title of the most pro prolific female murderer. She was convicted of torturing and killing hundreds of teenage girls, mostly from the minor gentry over a 20-year period. Much unsubstantiated folklore surrounds her grim deeds, including her supposedly bathing in the blood of her victims. She was saved from execution by her family's status and sentenced instead to life imprisonment in a cat castle. Bathory died shortly thereafter from prussic acid poisoning, a.k.a. cyanide thought to have been delivered through a meal of Veri's Herka, which is blood sausage, by an incensed relative of one of her victims. So is it the king who ate himself to death, the Illuminati crushing Legionnaire's disease victim, or the bathed in blood murderess, ironically killed by blood sausage? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a shame that we're not doing this a few years into the future, because these are all questions about essentially politicians dying from eating too much. And Donald Trump could have made the cut. I mean, it's really <laughs> unfortunate. Um, so I'm familiar with Elizabeth Bathory. It's the only one that oh. I'm really familiar with, uh, because she was rumored to be a vampire, right? She was yes. rumored uh, to, of, of bathing in the blood of these young girls in order to uh, to remain young and to, uh, you know, because she's a vampire, she needs to feed on blood. Um, I. As far as I know, she died when she was walled off into a tower, and so she must have died of, of, of lack of food and not from prussic acid poisoning. So I'm gonna say that that one is actually false. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm 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 gonna go. It's it's gonna be a toss up between one and two between Frederick and Charles, and I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with Charles with Legionnaire disease. I'm gonna say that's number number two is is a correct one. All right, thank you very much indeed, uh, Carmen. Would you like to have a go at this one? The king who ate himself to death, Illuminati crushing legionnaire's victim, or bathed in blood murderous? Um, I was also going to go for two, um, just because I feel but like... you I, can't now. I can't now, I can't. I mean, so I mean gonna, you can, but it ruins it for everybody. It so. ruin it. <laughs> I'm going to go... I also don't... I, can't, I knew a bit about Elizabeth Bathory from when I used to be a goth. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I don't know exactly how she died, all that much about her life. Um, so, actually, no, I'm going to go for Elizabeth Bathory. Come on, girl power. <laughs> <laughs> I like her on murderer like power. Yeah. I used to know a bit about her uh, from when I was a goth. Not a lot about how she died or much about her life. That that covers quite a lot. That rules out quite a lot about her. But it, girl it power. basically just the look, to be honest. I, 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 I admired her aesthetics. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. See, I, right, I was going to go for that one because I think Jonathan was very, very close to having it, saying that um, that she couldn't have died through poisoning because she was walled in. I actually think she did die from poisoning, but they walled her in as a way of covering up the fact that they poisoned her. It was just oh, the perfect okay. crime, you know, something from uh, like right. an Agatha Christie. Christy, so yeah. I would have gone for that had uh, Carmen's extensive biographical detail <laughs> on Elizabeth Bathory not come through. Um, so and otherwise, then I'm quite happy to go for this, uh, this king who, who lobsed himself to death. Um, it seems like a very kingy thing to do. So yeah, fine, we'll go with him. Adolf. You, you always go for Adolf. That's always been always, my motto my entire Adolf. life. Go Adolf. with Adolf. Well, the correct answer is him. The king who ate himself to death. Well done. Great reasoning there, Marsh. Great yeah, reasoning. Adolf. That's He's why actually, I it all about. People laughed when I got that tattoo. They said I'd regret that tattoo. But go <laughs> with Adolf. Honestly, it's great. Uh, the king who ate himself to death is actually the way he's referred to in Swedish history. King Adolf Frederick of Sweden um, ate Hetvarg, and they are cream-filled pastries which uh, are served in bowls of mi hot milk and cinnamon, and they look absolutely delicious. He had 14 of them. Okay, Marsh, it's your question next. Okay. 
Now, the first part of this question is to work out what the actual topic of this question is. We already know it'll be about food in some way, so I'm going to give you some clues and see if you can guess what we're talking about. So here are the initial clues. Marsh, you can have a guess first. Okay. Uh, one, it's a competitive activity. Two, the key skills are hand-to-eye coordination, a strategic mind, and the ability to multitask. And three, it might kill you. Well, I mean, there are many, many things I can imagine that uh, would be done competitively with hand-eye coordination. Is this is this hot dog eating? Now, I don't know if there's a lot of uh, hand-eye, uh, hand-eye coordination, absolutely competitive, absolutely kill you. I can imagine you could choke to death on a, on a hot dog. I don't know how much strategy strategy is really involved i think it's more tactical than strategic it's not okay. long term. if you're if you're swallowing 30 hot dogs at a time you are definitely not thinking long-term strategy that's a very short-term strategy but um <laughs> in lieu of anything else i'm going to say this is hot dog eating competitively all absolutely right thank you not absolutely not it has to be chopping carrots um you know <laughs> hand-eye coordination right I get very competitive in the kitchen when I'm chopping carrots. I'd um, love to see that, Jonathan. And it can kill it can kill you if you don't know how to how to wield a knife. And um, and there's a lot of strategy. Like how do you cut the carrot? Do you do the little uh, the little circles, or do you cut lengthwise and do the little sticks? <laughs> well, you do both. It depends what you're making. Yeah, I mean, do Honestly, you cook yeah. first or do you uh, do you peel first? Because if you peel first, you don't have to peel each individual there's bit a whole, afterwards. There's, there's a think. whole no-peel movement also. Yeah. Of like, no, you eat the whole thing. You don't want to waste, right? Get to a fight over, like the peel versus no-peel, cook versus no-cook. Yeah. I'm happy to have solved uh, the problem, Andy. We have Thank our you, answer. Jonathan. Thank you, Thank you. Well, just before we completely commit to it, uh, Carmen, what were your thoughts? I think it's a chili-eating competition. Okay. And my reasons are that, yes, they're competitive, incredibly competitive. People fly all over the world to take part in the most extreme chili eating competitions. They do require hand-eye coordination. You do not want your hands anywhere near your eyes. (laughs) 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 Strong element of strategy and knowing where your closest bathroom is. (laughs) <laughs> it kill you. Um, yeah, capsaicin is a horrible substance um, that can be very tasty in small quantities, but um, the larger quantities you get, the worse it gets. It's you know, it's the ingredient in pepper spray. It's, yeah. I'm going to change eating. Can I change right. my answer and 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 go with Carmen on this one? Uh, definitely not. No. <laughs> um, so. My final clue, should you have needed it, which you do not, would have been that one of the key techniques is called chipmunking. And the answer is less specific than both of Carmen's and Marsh's and much more accurate than Jonathan's, (laughs) which is competitive eating. Eating. Uh, Hang on, Andy. So the round was all about eating and your clue was it's competitive. (laughs) That's that's (laughs) somewhat giving us. I I absolutely knew that going in and I just I just had nothing else. (laughs) Um, So chipmunking is when at the end of the allocated time, competitors can stuff their faces with food and finish eating it even over the time allocated. In competitive eating, typically contestants are challenged to eat as many hot dogs or chicken wings as they can in a specified amount of time between five and 30 minutes. Now, Marsh, your question has multiple parts and a very awkward segue. See if you can spot it. In 2018, Molly Scheuler set a world record for eating wings. How many wings do you think she ate in 30 minutes, Marsh? It's not multiple choice. Just have a stab. This is only the first part. This is 3-0, 30 minutes. 3-0 minutes, yeah. Ah, see, when it comes to hot dogs, I don't know why I keep going to hot dogs, but my mind was hot dogs first. I know they can like power through hot dogs very, very quickly, and, and they can they can stuff more into them than you would think humanly possible. So I reckon yeah. she's definitely at multiple wings per minute, mm-hmm. uh, or uh, or WPM over the course of uh, the half hour. Um, so I reckon she's probably gonna ru- she's gonna start off at like four to five WPM, but she's gonna start slowing down. So I'm gonna go with. A hundred. I reckon she can do a hundred in half an hour. Okay, thank you, Marsh. Uh, Carmen? I mean, that's a really... A wings per minute number. If you know how to eat a wing properly, it's one bite. So in a minute, you start off... Um, I am a meat eater uh, for my sins. Um, so, yeah, I think you could probably get quite a lot done in the first... I think a hundred is conservative. Okay. I, I'm going to say a hundred and twenty. <laughs> exactly what I was going to say, actually. 
it? One hundred and one. Actually, I think <laughs> I have one hundred and twenty right there. <laughs> I'm calm. I'm gonna have to I, change it. I can't. Is it, is, it, is, it, is it Price is Right rules, Andy? If I go over, I'm eliminated. Is that how it this depends works? how much I like you? Mm, you like me a lot, so I'm <laughs> oh. gonna go with. 140 wings. 140 okay. wings. But yeah. just before we discuss your guesses, Carmen, what's the correct way to eat a chicken wing? Um, so uh, there's there's two different ways um, that you want to split it in half, and then there's one part of the wing that's got two bones in it. You can you can strip that off in one go, and then the other side has only got the one bone, and you strip that off in one go. Wow. So, yeah. I love where the common has multiple different techniques. Just in case you want a showboat, you know, you want to sort of vary it all, play, play to the crowd. It depends who you're taking to you know what I mean? <laughs> Mom, it's a different kind of fish than if you're going on a first date. <laughs> all right. So the correct answer is an astonishing 501. What? 501. This is what it looks like when somebody eats... Uh, David, full screen, please. Oh, this is what it looks toilet, like please. when somebody eats all <laughs> of those. Uh, is Andy just going to do it? <laughs> that's what he's waiting for. Here we are. Here we are. There you go. Half an hour long. Radio. This is what it looks like. Okay. She's just powering. I think she's using one of your techniques there. Yeah, but I, I love that she has her her hair away from her face oh, yes. uh, by her shaving strategic. both sides of her head. That's commitment. Yeah, isn't it? well, she's got a little ponytail there. For later, yeah. <laughs> now the confetti. So, yeah. That's Jeez. what that looks like. Well. Okay. So much confetti, you can't even see her barfing it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not allowed to barf uh, until afterwards. There so, we go, com afterwards, yeah. competitive eating has a dark history of choking. Sometimes dark meat death. history. <laughs> Sometimes to death. That, Jonathan, I'm not sure it's worth. I'm not sure that that deserved how how happy you seemed after you stopped. <laughs> but thank you for interrupting to interject with that. Sure. My <laughs> yeah. pleasure. Uh, stomach rupture, water intoxication, heart attacks, and even a broken jaw are some of the ailments. Almost one one of these is almost certainly to have been the cause of King Adolf Frederick's death. In the last question, and to mention hot dogs, they have been described as the perfect choking hazard. But for the next part of Marsh's question, oh, can described by who? Like Chalking Monthly. <laughs> that sounds like an accurate <laughs> rather than a warning. By medical professions, professionals, oh. because I'm not going to go into it, but there's a whole pseudoscience that argues that hot dogs should be reformulated so that they present less of a choking hazard. And that idea is based on an inaccurate uh, analysis of the data about how many children get choked by hot dogs. Wow, you, you really go. do do weird research for this show. Well, you it's been useful on magazine. that occasion. <laughs> so the next part of your question, Marsh, concerns Limburger. Uh, does anyone here know what or who a Limburger is? And we'll start with Carmen, please. Do you know what Limburger is? A Limburger. Is it a pet? Oh, so I have to guess if it's a person or if it's... No, a just tell me if you know it or not. I have no idea. <laughs> no, Marsh? So the answer, the, the question is, do you know it? So yeah, we can you know say is? yes or no. There's no speculation, yes no, there's no, no comic riffing. No, this you are a, just a gateway to binary. get to Jonathan. Here. Zero or one. <laughs> no, I don't know what it is. Jonathan, do you know what Limburger is? Uh, I do know what lean burgers are, and those are my preferred burgers. I don't like a lot of a lot of fat in my meat. Is yeah. is the Limburger the uh, cut that was made from that baby that went missing from yes. uh, from that uh, that that airplane guy, <laughs> Charles is Lindbergh? The, yeah, it's the, it's the same baby that they get all the vaccines from. Yeah, same. Ah, yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, Limburger is a type of cheese which I expected Jonathan to recognize. And it's a type of cheese which... My child intolerant, Andy. Don't, don't at scare room me. temperature is spreadable, and the classic way to enjoy it is to spread it thickly on bread. Add a slice of onion, and you're good to go. It's also known as Hevre cheese. Or oh. fromage de Hevre. Yeah, I, th I think I've seen that in the supermarket. Okay, and okay. It has been manufactured in Limburg in Belgium since the 15th century, but in Canada... It's manufactured by the Oak Grove Cheese Company in New Hamburg, Ontario. Yes, oh. a hamburger makes a Limburger. It's it's very funny. It's very funny. I'm laughing so, on the other side. Well worth it. In, uh, in 1906, in, in Illinois, Frank Miller died after a Limburger eating contest between friends. He ate a pound of the stuff and died shortly afterwards. His competitors were also hospitalized. But it turns out Limburger cheese harbors a surprising superpower. 
What Marsh, what is the connection between Limburger and mosquitoes? And did you spot the awkward segue? Was Which that the I awkward did? segue? That was it. I don't is it a segue if you make no effort to connect the two things together? Well, I leapt. <laughs> I leapt from cheese to mosquitoes. But anyway, uh, what is the connection between Limburger and mosquitoes? Is it number one? Limburger cheese smells like stinky feet. Mosquitoes like stinky feet, but they like the smell of Limburger better. So it's been deployed as an attractant to distract mosquitoes away from tasty humans. Or is it two? Mosquitoes are indeed attracted to Limburger cheese that has the unique property of rendering a female mosquito infertile. It is the females who do all the blood sucking because they repurpose some properties of the blood for reproduction. Limburger contains a, type, a unique type of acid which gets on their feet and then into the body when the mosquito is grooming itself. Cuba is the world's biggest importer of Limburger cheese for precisely this reason. Or is it three? Mosquitoes react strangely to Limburger cheese. It has a psychotic quality, which, when they are exposed to the odour coming from it, causes them to behave erratically. For example, mosquitoes in the proximity of this cheese have been known to fight each other and also have orgies, which are both unusual behaviours for mosquitoes. So is it the attractive stinky cheese, the Limburger cheese rendering female mosquitoes infertile, or the mosquitoes orgy-inducing orgy indu psychotic trip? I really like that last one because it relies on somebody seeing a mosquito and saying, I think that's behaving erratically. That is not a sensible <laughs> behaviour for a mosquito because I don't think I've ever seen a mosquito that I would describe as not erratic. Have you never heard of the spider experiments with LSD? <laughs> it also kind of implies that someone has been observing mosquitoes having an orgy, which is a level of like insect voyeurism. I don't know how you'd get past an ethics committee. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I I don't think it's the erratic one. I'm not sure. I, I, I don't think anybody has ever seen a mosquito and said, I think that mosquito there is doing things absolutely by the book. That is a textbook bit of mosquitoing. I think they're always a bit erratic. So I like the idea of um, the cheese making uh, female mosquitoes infertile. I know there's some developments that have allowed like people to to make uh, the, the, the female mosquitoes infertile and so they don't bite. I don't think those are cheese, but I just like the idea of Cuba importing so much of it that they just lather it on. Um, I, I went to Cuba about 15, 20 years ago. I didn't spot them doing that. So I, I, I'm going to go with the first one because I, I don't buy those other two. So yeah, they, the smell, it, the, the, it goes to the cheese rather than goes to you. Okay, got it. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Carmen, do you want to have a go at this one? Yeah, I mean, I really just love the idea of filming a mosquito orgy. Um, <laughs> I, I just, I think that's that's an amazing... What would that even look like? Do they have like a special room that they go into? Is there a chill out space? Um, you know, are they just all passing around these Limburger sandwiches? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really putting my cheese and wine parties to shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, I, and also, I think maybe you know, we, none of us really like mosquitoes. I don't like mosquitoes. I was actually just looking today on like ways to get rid of them. Um, but maybe that's just that they're misunderstood. Maybe maybe someone who likes mosquitoes could tell when they're behaving erratically. You know, I don't know. May, I, I'm going to go for number three. I feel like the you know I, I'm I'm interested in the psychonautic experiments of mosquitoes oh, and where nice. they lead to their burgeoning sexualities. Cool, nice one. Thank you, and Jonathan. Yeah, um, I I think that that the number one with the, the stinky feet it's too simple an explanation. I, I think I think that's made up. Um, I was gonna go with the with the orgy, but now I can't. Uh, I can't just imagine Andy watching these mosquitoes and going, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that was a well, very good Andy Wilson impression. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Jonathan, you can it. join in if you want on Swarm Hub. <laughs> no. Well done, well done. Um, and so I'm gonna have to go with uh, with the uh, the mosquitoes being rendered infertile. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a little scene a uh, sequel to the fly. There was a fly, the fly two, and that would have been the fly three, and then no more because the fly is now infertile. I know flies are not mosquitoes, but I'm gonna go with number two. Final Thank answer. you very much. All right. Well, the correct answer is it's number one. Limburger really? cheese smells awful. It is most often con compared to the smell of really stinky feet. Can anybody guess 
why it would smell like stinky feet. Is it uh, slightly gone off? Is it one of the cheeses that the way they make it, is it slightly starts to go off? Um, I know you get some cheeses that are um, created to have maggots in them, for example, to yeah. sort of like rot and, and have it. Is it something like that? Is there is there a microorganism that is common to both this kind of cheese and to particularly, you know, pathologically stinky feet? Yeah, like athlete's foot for cheese. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the correct answer, Jonathan. Well oh, done, sir. Go. Well done. Okay. It's thanks to the bacterium Brevibacterium linens, which is exactly the same one responsible for smelly feet. It's mm -hmm. added to the cheese during manufacturing. Mosquitoes absolutely love this stuff, don't, and it's been don't used. Do that. Don't. <laughs> and it's been used as an attractant to distract mosquitoes from humans. Nowadays, of course, the bacterium is applied to the cheese in a controlled way. How does my panel think the monks who first made this cheese applied the bacterium? It's it's going to be the wine crushing type thing, isn't it? They're just standing. One hundred percent. They trampled yeah. the cheese with their naked feet, it's which disgusting. is quite the picture. <laughs> How do you feel about it, Jonathan? <laughs> As a disgusting, it's disgusting. <laughs> but that's kind of happened. Students. At some point, that happened for the first time. I know. So yeah, I can't figure that out. There was a guy who got caught, and then he was like, <laughs> "No, but I'm, I'm doing. It's a transformation process. <laughs> Trust me, we're gonna eat it afterwards." <laughs> oh, it was a goodness. kink, you know. It was. <laughs> yeah, totally. So, in 1996, Bart Knowles published a paper which showed that mosquitoes were equally attracted to smelly feet and Limburger cheese, for which he was the proud recipient of an Ig Nobel, Ig Nobel Award. Yes. Huh. And question three in round two. This is for you, Carmen. Microwave ovens are ubiquitous in kitchens all over the world. The technology was invented by accident in 1946. Which of the following did it also lead to? Is it one? When it was made, I love that you're all making notes. I love that. When it was made, <laughs> when it was made commercially available, there was some adoption, even though it was very expensive. Unfortunately, the manufacturers, the manufacturers hadn't yet perfected the slotted choke method to contain the microwaves within the device. In one example, a user lost three fingers after standing in close proximity to the device. Or is it two? Microwave energy was used in early experiments to reanimate frozen hamsters. The hamsters would be brought down to temperature in an ice bath, ice bath until the heart stopped beating. Then, after an hour and a half, microwaves were targeted at the heart to restart it. This replaced the initial hot spoon method of targeted reheating. Or is it three? The magnetron responsible for generating the microwave energy consumes significant power. In the USA in 1979, when microwave sales peaked hugely, this caused several problems for power companies. The first sounds familiar in that peak demand would happen during ad breaks in sports fixtures as families reloaded their popcorn. There were some outages for this reason, but the second is that the machines were left on standby all day. The cumulative power load from millions of microwaves on standby meant that all the substation circuit breakers had to be upgraded to co cope with a new average consumption. Unfortunately, it took two years to recognise the problem and regular power outages across the USA occurred until the problem was diagnosed. So, Carmen, is it microwaving fingers, bringing dead hamsters back to life, or an undiagnosed power demand? Okay, I'm going to go through these one by one. So I've never heard of the slotted choke method. That doesn't sound safe at all. <laughs> if there's a safe word though, Carmen, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking of my microwave, which came with my flat and it's very old um, and it's stained yellow. Um, I, if they're all its faults, I can't imagine losing my fingers in it. Um, well, remember that in history, when these first came out, they were more like the size of a double, double oven. They were really tall. Remember that. Right. They were okay. very different to the technology we see today. Okay. All right. So maybe, possibly, I'm not sure. Um, microwave energy hamsters and the hot spoon method. I love the idea of a reanimated hamsters. Is that a thing? Are they like real world applications? Well, I guess they would be. This yeah. is the part where you answer the question rather than ask the question, <laughs> Carmen. I'm just going through the system, right? Don't interrupt my process. Um, I mean, if I had a hamster and it died and I put it in the microwave. Mm -hmm. For anyone watching this at home, do not do this. <laughs> setting. 
my microwave's got a kebab setting. <laughs> <laughs> so stick a toothpick through it first, right? I think, yeah, it has to be a wooden one, obviously. Yes. <laughs> yeah. There is no hamster setting on your microwave oven, that is true. <laughs> so I just break the word magnetron and then my brain kind of did a... Thing. Yeah, just a, a general increase in the power usage because these things were left on standby all day. Yeah, that's cool. And, and I, I also I did catch at the end that you said it was the United States. I know that yeah. there was issues in in the UK with power outages due to everyone putting on their kettles at the same time when Coronation Street had an ad break. Um, I think I'm going to go for number two because the idea of reanimating hamsters is amazing. Brilliant. It's got Brilliant. to be one. It has to be. You need to get the scientists on this now. <laughs> Thank you, Carmen. Um, uh, Jonathan. Uh, it can't be number two because that is actually the plot to the next sequel uh, for Disney's <laughs> for Disney's Frozen. <laughs> <laughs> They're gonna sell a lot of hamster plush toys. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go with number three, uh, the outages. That must be the correct one. OK, thank you, Jonathan. OK, and Marsh. Yeah, so I, I was also uh, interested in the slotted chalk. Oh, the vanilla version of it, I think, is actually the hot spoon method. I think those are um, two, two different ways of doing it. Um, what Carl was saying about the Coronation Street kettle thing, I think that might have been an urban myth. I think it might have been something that was put out. I, this could be totally wrong. I might be massively misinforming you and everybody who's watching, but I think that As was something... That was uh, yeah, I think it was something that was just a way of kind of put out by by someone to try and uh, talk about uh, these kind of water cooler type moments in the in uh, in the nation. So I'm I'm going to go with the losing the fingers in a slotted chalk, um, oh, which is okay. the first time I promise I've said that. And um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not yeah, yes, Queen earlier. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of so, yes today. You've got Yas Queen as your uh, ringtone and uh, losing your fingers in a slotted chalk can be the text message. Uh, just uh, hit me oh, up, Jonathan. Good. I'll record that for you. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll go for that one. All right. So the correct answer is the hamsters. Well done, Carl. Really? Well done. Wow. Uh, the answer is hamsters being brought back to life with microwave energy, which is really fascinating and really gruesome. In the early 1950s in the UK, experimentation was underway in the exciting new field of cryobiology. The experiments are pretty gross, but basically involved de uh, dunking live hamsters in an ice bath that was at ne negative five Celsius. Once their hearts had stopped beating, they were left in there for another 60 to 90 minutes. Upon removal, a sample hamster was cut in half to determine how frozen they were. Needless to say, you, no you attempt not, was made. You, you did not want to be the sample hamster. <laughs> that is, uh, I thought you were going to say it was one that wasn't even frozen. It's like, so we've, we've, we've frozen all the hamsters, and the, then we've got the a sample hamster. hamster just to check what it's meant to look like inside. Yep. No, they wanted to determine the amount of froze. So, um, so would anybody like to have a stab at... Actually, I'd like to hear Jonathan the do the hamster. This. <laughs> Jonathan, could you have a stab at talking us through the hot spoon method of reanimation, please? Including I've, the answer to the question, why? Yeah, I've I've never heard of it. I'm not a I'm not a resusc resuscitation uh, expert at all. Uh, the hot spoon. I mean, I'm guessing that you you heat up a spoon and you put the hamster against it, and it acts as a as an energy source, and it emits heat, and it slowly warms up the little hamster, the little furry animal. Uh, yeah, but you could do that with the whole animal. So the hot spoon method of reanimation was developed because warming the whole animal at once was unsuccessful. But they found that targeting the heart area first using a hot spoon, then warming the rest, had an amount of success. Unfortunately, the temperature required of the hot spoon caused significant injuries and distress to the animal as it reanimated. And a scientist wanted to improve the outcomes for these hamsters and came up with a method of using microwave energy to avoid burning and singeing. The same scientist is also responsible for an invention called the electron capture detector, which was the first to measure the widespread presence of CFCs in the atmosphere and later went on to develop a controversial hypothesis about the Earth in which all living and non-living things are connected and interact with each other in, in such a way that one could describe the Earth as a living organism. Now, I'm going to ask this part of the question first to our audience. In the Twitch comments, 
Does anybody know the name of the scientist or the theory? And if you get it right, you will win irreplaceable, incredulous gold stars. So I'm looking at the Twitch chat, but there's going to be a bit of a delay. Yeah, uh, so I, 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 I you can, are I correct. Phobocop straight in with both the name of the um, the person and the theory. Okay, can panel? I just say I, I'm very happy that the hot spoon uh, method was not the scientist spooning <laughs> with the frozen hamster because that's. <laughs> That's what I hoped it was. I'm not. I'm happy. I'm not happy at all that it wasn't. It is, that. It, is, well, it, it is kind of cuddly, I suppose. But I mean, we're assuming that the hamster was the little spoon. <laughs> we are assuming, yes. <laughs> all right. So, uh, does anybody on my panel recognise what I'm describing? Either knowing the name of the scientist or the theory. Is it James Lovelace and Gaia theory? Mm. James Lovelace. Um, you're thinking of his sister, the uh, award-winning Ada. soft por soft porn actor. Yeah. I, is it Lovelock? I'm, I'm, Lovelock. Love luck. I'll just say, I think it's I interviewed him about yeah. twelve years ago. Did about you? Ten, 10 or twelve years ago, I think. So it was just in the back of my back of my mind on a, on a podcast well, a long, well. long time ago. And do you remember the name of the hy hypothesis? It's Gaia theory. It's Gaia. It's the Gaia hypothesis. Um, now um, that's a whole different subject, so we're not going to go into that. But the work on cryobiology actually led to really big advances in low temperature surgery, organ transport for the purposes of transplantation and the preservation of frozen sperm. Uh, Lovelock is now 101 years old. And that's the end of round two. Congratulations, everybody. Well done. Well done. Can I just check, Andy, um, the frozen sperm, do they also use the hot spoon method for that? <laughs> I hope so. I really <laughs> hope so. <laughs> All right. Uh, OK, the Twitch chat is going crazy. Well done to everybody who got James Lovelock, Karen Tankerous, uh, Skepticalism Sim, Skeptical Sim. Uh, yeah, a few more. OK, very good. Well done, incredulous audience. Right. Time to see the other part of your efforts from tonight. Uh, when we play round three, defend the indefensible. We'll try and go around a couple of times on this. Um, so it's time to hear um, uh, what the audience think you should defend. Uh, it's going to be 45 seconds. I'll have a timer on the clock, and we're going to get going now. So, David, I'm about to put the timer on. Um, let's do this first. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to go first with Marsh. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the topic is from Skeptical Gumby, Piers Morgan. Go. So I'm defending Piers Morgan. I actually think Piers Morgan is someone who people actually don't see that he's actually a very, very good, very smart, very, uh, very uh, intelligent person. So, for example, look at the phone hacking scandal. Loads of people went to prison over that. Piers Morgan hacked those phones and he's not in prison. He got away with it. You've got to be very smart and very capable to get away with hacking Paul McCartney's phone. Admit it live on BBC radio and never go to prison over it, even though you can <laughs> then go to Parliament and lie about it. People say Piers Morgan during the coronavirus uh, showed that he actually is a very smart guy who knows an awful lot of stuff and where's this Piers Morgan come from he's changed his mind no he always knew what was right all the times he was wrong previously just showed that he wanted to be a prick he always knew what the right thing was he was choosing not to now when he's right it's not a mistake it's it's a, a tactic well done Marsh your time is up congratulations thank you very much um the second one on our list is also for Marsh but I'm going to come back to that one shortly uh so uh Skeptical Gumby's come up with another one we might come back to that one uh, hmm, somebody called Go On, Try and Defend That. Uh, Jonathan, this is for you. Uh, Marmite is disgusting and should be banned. I have to defend the saying or I have to def defend Marmite? You have to defend that Marmite is actually disgusting. So Marmite is actually very disgusting. We don't even have it here in I'm Canada. I'm just going to restart your timer, actually, because you yeah. stole, so, stole some time there. Please. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so Marmite is actually very disgusting. Uh, that's why we don't uh, store it in Canada. You can't even buy this and it's not even legal. You can't import it or export it at all. It is made with the bacterium that is responsible for stinky feet and for that type of cheese that we mentioned earlier. 
<laughs> uh, they just put that in there. They put some goo in there, and that's your Marmite that you spread on your toasts. Um, it is <laughs> absolutely, I mean, it could be used uh, for biological warfare. Uh, actually, there is there's going to be a, a big meeting of the United Nations very soon uh, to come to an agreement, uh, just like the nuclear uh, disarmament agreement, uh, to never uh, sell Marmite anywhere because that thing will kill you. <laughs> that's all I have to say about this. It's disgusting. Well, that's 45 seconds. Congratulations. Well Thank done. You. Well done. OK, Carmen, you're next. Um, uh, Carmen, yours is from Igor. And yours is autism causes vaccine uh, causes vaccines. Ready, go. Um, autism causes vaccines. I would actually go one step further and say all types of neurodiversity have contributed to the improvement of vaccines uh, globally. Um, I think it takes a special type of person um, who must obviously be neurodiverse in order to connect ideas together in a way that is very difficult for neurotypical people to do. Um, I am a huge fan of autistics. It is likely I am one myself, um, although uh, as someone raised female, um, that obviously never got spotted. I'm very good at masking. Um, so yes, I would say that autism absolutely does cause vaccines to be created and the world would be a worse place without neurodiversity and vaccines. Yes, very nice, very nice. Just not, for the audience, not sure how, how is, indefensible that was. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. But uh, just, just is this international sign language for something? Masking. That I love that. I love the the sign movement. language for Yas Queen is what it is. <laughs> there's a there's a cat who wants to play now. Apparently, I do have a cat on my lap. I have been uh, yes. very cool. Oh, watch, chat, the, yeah. watch the Twitch chat go crazy. Okay, we're back to you, Marsh. <laughs> this one is uh, from Big Jizzy Man Cow. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. I understand there's Only a website the called that. There is a website that Eli Bosnick set up and redirected it to my Wikipedia page. That's so, uh, yes. <laughs> so, from Big Jizzy Mankow, can't say that enough, <laughs> defend the idea that Marsh wasn't responsible for COVID. This is a very easy thing for, for me to def uh, defend. There is no way in the world that I was responsible for COVID. I have uh, been far too busy causing all the other atrocities that are out there. I'm not even looking at COVID. That's too obvious. You don't even know the things that I've been getting up to, the things that I'm going to uh, unleash upon the world. Because you just think, right, you've had your COVID. That was somebody else. I'm not even going to drop them in it. They're going to show themselves to the world soon. You had your COVID just as you get back out in the world. Bam, my first plan is going to hit you and it's going to absolutely blow your mind. You think you're going to be back out there in restaurants and seeing friends and seeing family and having like relationships and actually enjoying your life? Absolutely not. I have plans for the entire world to keep you all locked down, under control, uh, and where I can be broadcasting you uh, on a regular basis on Incredulous. That's my plan for the entire world. You did sound disturbingly like Donald Trump at the end. <laughs> but, uh, thank you very much, Marsh. Very good. I was so much so that Mildred has now left. She actually wanted oh. no, no part of any of that. She's fucked off. And who can blame Mildred for that? Uh, Jonathan, are you familiar with uh, a chap called Matt Hancock in the UK? And his I'm recent, not. His recent exploits? Not. I'll save that one for Carmen then. Hopefully she <laughs> does. Um, there's a very good one here that I love called uh, from Tammy. Tammy Webster, X. Uh, and uh, Jonathan, you must defend the idea that you should definitely take medical advice from a podcast. Ready, go. So obviously, uh, you know, as we all know, doctors cannot be trusted unless they have a microphone in front of their faces and they are talking about Bombas socks. Uh, so if you ever hear, uh, you know, anybody, you know, they might not even have medical credentials, but if they have a podcast and they are selling you Bombas socks or some kind of Casper mattress or movement watches, which are the, just the best watches ever made in China, um, you know, you should trust what they have to say on medical conditions any sort of medical conditions really because that is where the truth lies now it, it has to be because otherwise you're just suppressing free speech is what i'm saying and you should never suppress free speech it's the marketplace of ideas and podcasting is where it's at fantastic thank you very much very good very good okay carmen carmen uh would you defend please from mike oxlong shagging your fuck buddy during covid lockdown while in government I think that was quite beautifully phrased, that question, actually. <laughs> Good work, Mike Oxlong. Okay, ready? Go. 
Um, yeah, so it's really important to continue to shag your fuck buddy regardless of the global situation, otherwise they would cease to be a fuck buddy, thus negating the need for one in the first place. If you do not fuck your fuck buddy, then they're just a buddy, and that's no fun for anyone, um, other than, I don't know, the platonic side of a buddy friendship I don't really have buddies um I have really good friends so yes um I think it's imperative to fuck a fuck buddy um the sharing of uh, liquids during that time as long as you're in some kind of bubble with them um in a kink way I guess if that's your thing might be quite good I guess um so here I am defending fucking a fuck buddy during a pandemic I thought I'm gonna go for a shower after this <laughs> Good work, good work. You've put the idea of um, a bubble of human fluids inside my mind now, and I can't really get rid of that, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, uh, should we do one more before we finish? Sure. If one more? To... Okay, Marsh. Um, let's have uh, Skeptical Gumby uh, has got another one there. I want to choose somebody who's not we've not had yet. So, uh, uh, ooh, Nadia, Nadia. Uh, so, Marsh, microwaves are radioactive. They change food DNA, cause cancer, and should be banned. Well, normally these are meant to be things that are indefensible, but this is really obvious. I mean, if you think about what a microwave does, it is a little box of weird magic that we should not trust. You put cold things in there, they come out hot. There is no visible heat source. I know from having studied science, as long as I've had to, to do a science podcast for 12 years, that if you can't see heat, it's not there. So something else is going on. What's actually going on is that is the way that your food gets heated up. It's not through actual radiation. It's actually just through pure evil. Now, a lot of scientists don't actually seem to acknowledge. Not only science textbooks will even mention the presence of pure evil as a state of matter or one of the, the elements on the periodic table, but actually it is the main thing involved in a microwave. That's why you shouldn't have them. They just shoot evil at all of your food. You don't want that. You no, didn't you even don't. mention the demonic ice crystals. <laughs> <laughs> Which is that a real thing. Yours. That might come a real yours. claim. <laughs> or the reanimation of hamsters. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. That's For which... Spoons for which the next question might be relevant. Uh, this is from Tom Berry, um, and this is for Jonathan. Jonathan, Gwyneth Paltrow should get the Nobel Prize for medicine. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, uh, so Gwyneth Paltrow should absolutely get the Nobel Prize in medicine. I mean, for the JDAG alone, I think that she is exploring new horizons, uh, you know, strange new worlds, uh, all that Star Trek stuff, uh, but inside the human body. And I mean, really, it would be it would be a shame if an actual medical doctor won the Nobel Prize in medicine, because they always do. That's the problem. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a little click. It's the old boys club, as always. It's a cigar chomping, you know, club skis. And now it's time for a woman who is not a medical doctor to win the Nobel Prize uh, in medicine. I think I think we need to be more open minded about these things. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's not it's not always evidence based what she says, but it comes from the heart. <laughs> OK, fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Carmen, it falls upon you to bring it home. Uh, this is from Grimbeard and sadly will be the last one. There are three more here from Eagle. I feel as though I did one from Eagle. Did I do one from Eagle? You did one from Eagle. Yeah. OK, that's cool. So Grimbeard, your moment in the sunlight. This is for Carmen. Conspiracy theories are all just a conspiracy by the makers of Baco Foil. Go. Uh, yes, that is absolutely true. So all conspiracy theories um, can actually be traced back to um, Baco Foil and their incessant desire to sell more foil in order to make hats for everyone. Um, so it is uh, Baco the foil that has been responsible for every single um, conspiracy theory that they merely put out just to detract in attention away from them, but in such a way that you still go out and buy more um, any type of foil. But the chances are that some of that will be Baco foil because they do hold quite a large share of the market. So, yeah, Baco foil are absolutely responsible for all conspiracy theories. All roads <laughs> lead to Rome, all conspiracy theories lead to Baco foil. Nice. Lovely. Well done. Can, well can done their big evil plan be uh, foiled by any chance? Can their plan Yay. be foiled? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's it for that. I'll just read a couple more quick ones out. Uh, we didn't do uh, that England's win was stolen. Um, the Russian president should be given control over the world. There's a life form in the world superior to cats. 
defend that one. <laughs> Marsha was right to steal his vaccine from an old lady. I don't know what that means. <laughs> oh, yes, I do. Uh, defend banning pants made of fit mixed fabrics, which I first thought said feces. Uh, another one from Tom. That was from Feugel. The other, um, the, Tom Berry gave another one. Licking someone is better than a handshake. Nice. Must be busy, Tom Berry. Putting a camera in the gym, showers is okay as long as you feel bad about it. Tom, really? <laughs> uh, Gray the Earthling, last one. A scientific theory is just as valid as anyone else's theory because why should we be controlled by scientists? Well, that is it for Incredulous today. And it's time for me to determine this week's winner. I'll be consulting in a moment with my scoring team and taking out my divining rods. Just give me a second. Nope, and he's gone to answer the door again. <laughs> <laughs> we can still see you, Andy. <laughs> Leaning out of frame, but not quite. Yeah. Yeah. Which is also great for what is ostensibly an audio podcast as well that you're yeah. going to be putting out. So that was just you leading. Visual humor is yeah. just lovely, fantastic. Lovely bit of business. Yeah. Uh, so the winner is Carmen. Yay. Congratulations, Carmen. You are the new reigning champion of Incredulous. Please speak to your people and tell them what's on your mind. Uh, thank you very much uh, to my co-panelists and host Andy Wilson um, and all of the team. I couldn't have done it without your support. Um, I'd like to thank my mum for always believing in me, um, my dad for not really being around to get in my way. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you to my partner for always being supportive. He's in the next room being very quiet watching this one. <laughs> Hi, Richard. <laughs> Hi, Richard. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, that's it for Incredulous for tonight and also for Skeptics in the Pub Online for this week. Remember to tune in next week for Resisting the Knowledge Dementors, the truth about post-truth with Professor Stefan Lewandowski. Um, that's just one S away from saying Professors Steph Stefan Lew. And what, I, what I like is that you keep getting multiple t attempts to get it right, and you keep yeah. getting it wrong in different ways, which is uh, a great thing to do with somebody's with name. name. Nothing yeah. if not inventive. Follow the link, uh, sitp.online slash donate to generously donate. Or if money isn't your thing, like a few videos on YouTube. It all helps. Thanks to my production assistant, Rachel Waller, novice question maker, Mark Horn, and also to uh, Morgan Clark, who has the unenviable task of deriving a satisfactory podcast version from this melee. And of course, to the entire technical team who works so feverishly behind the teams, behind the scenes, to make these, uh, these shows happen. So all that remains now is to thank my incredible panel of guests, Carmen de Cruz, Jonathan Jerry, and of course, Michael Marshall. Say goodbye, everyone. We'll see you next time we play Incredulous. Fun. Bye. <laughs>